thank you so much for coming today. I know it's been a long day and it's a long week, but we are thrilled that you're here. Um, and I'm going to get started on time because I know everyone has happy hours to get to after our session. Um, so my name is Valerie Redhorse Mole. I am of Cherokee heritage, and I'm delighted to be able to uh, present an amazing panel today of very accomplished women. Uh, we tried to get some men, but it just turned out the women were uh, the movers and shakers. So, <laughs> um, But I wanted to just start with a little bit of introduction on why we decided to do this panel and um, a little bit about the history of investing in Indian country and some facts and figures, and then we'll get um, started with our esteemed panel that really represents kind of a different diverse sector from different areas in Indian country. So I am currently the executive director of Investor Circle and Social Venture Network, which has nothing to do with Indian country. We're one of the oldest social impact nonprofits, and that's what brings me to SOCAP. Um, but prior to that, I spent 30 years as an investment banker, primarily facilitating the flow of capital and structuring capital into American Indian tribal nations. And in my career, my team and I facilitated about $3 billion of capital, um, but it wasn't easy. I have gray hair and scars, and, and I can tell you that it was, it was just frustrating along the journey to see how many um, problems that we still face in Indian country. And earlier this year, um, when I moved, I moved up from Southern California to Northern California, and I met a lot of wonderful people that have a heart for investing into indigenous communities, and I never knew these people. And, and they said to me, you know, there's this sort of mystique about American Indian tribes, and uh, many funds that I continue to meet and foundations are very active in other countries with indigenous investments, and yet they're a little nervous about going into Wisconsin or New York or Arizona and New Mexico, and it doesn't make sense to me. But at the same time, um, what we're trying to do today is just, you know, open some of those doors, bring down some of those walls. Let's talk about investing in Indian country, the challenges, and also the benefit. So as, uh, and I know some of you are American Indian in the audience, and I know some of you are very involved in the space, so this is a little repetitive. Um, but I want to just start with um, some information to kind of frame our conversation. So there are about 562 what we call federally recognized tribal nations in the United States, and that's where they actually have a treaty between the government of the tribe and the government, the federal government and they're federally recognized. There's about another 200 that are state recognized, and there's a whole bunch, I don't know how many, that are actually trying to apply for that recognition that somehow they were terminated or overlooked. So in that relationship, um, their land, if you're federally recognized, is held in trust by the United States government, but it is considered sovereign land. So there are some obstacles if we're talking about lending or investing into Indian country. When you have trust land, it's not really, um, you don't really have a real estate play. You, don't, you can't put liens on the land. You, you can't make equity investments into the land. But over the years, a very developed market has uh, been developed. And you're going to hear today from Heather, who is an American Indian law specialist, among other things. And she can talk a little bit more about some of the ways um, the legal system has facilitated investments into Indian country. I will tell you that um, one of the things I learned as an investment banker was there was this fear from the markets, from the capital markets about sovereign immunity, thinking that tribes could simply say, we're not going to pay you back and we're sovereign and we can just kind of say no uh, and you can't do anything to us, you can't sue us. And, and really the market has been able to um, get around that with limited waivers of sovereign immunity. There's very smart attorneys working in the space now and the bottom line is we have um, a good relationship between capital and Indian tribes. However, that market was really created by gaming. And I think most of us are in this room to think about other ways for other areas of economic development uh, besides gaming. And there's nothing wrong with gaming. And I think all of us sitting here who have worked with tribes can tell you that gambling 
and hospitality is the one industry that has really brought most of our tribes from absolute poverty into um, economic progress and, and the ability to move forward. That doesn't mean we're advocates and proponents of gaming. It doesn't mean we sit at the slot machines, but we do see the benefit. And so the benefit of having conversations like this is really looking at how do we go from here, you, knowing that we at least have some economic base, but trying to expand and looking at other ways and new opportunities. And so again, I'm just so appreciative that you're here and we definitely want to allow time at the end for questions because we have a, a long history, all of us, in working it with underserved communities and in Indian country, but we wanna hear your questions so we can hopefully um, get those relationships going and, and really we wanna see more interaction between social impact and American Indian um, communities within the US borders. So with that, I'm going to start with the panel discussion and, and I tried to arrange it today kind of from um, the youngest demographic, you know, moving into kind of more mature investments. And um, we're gonna start at the end of the table with one of my best friends in the world, someone that I revere so much. And her name is Carla Knapp and she is um, a Penobscot Indian originally from the state of Maine. And I met her many, many years ago and she works tirelessly for the Boys and Girls Clubs um, in Indian country. And there's a specific division within Boys and Girls Clubs that focuses on our youth. And it is probably the hardest job that I've ever seen anyone do. And she doesn't like it when we focus on the negative because she focuses on the positive. But I feel that I have to give you a little bit of an idea that when you look at stats in America, with unemployment, it's always so much worse on Indian reservations. So we often have 50 to 60% unemployment rates on reservations. And then when you look at where our kids come out in it, they're often unsupervised, um, there's substance abuse, there's cycles of poverty. The one thing that makes me really sad is we have some of the highest teenage suicide rates of anywhere in the country. And so what Carla's, um, organization has been able to do the Boys and Girls Club and they actually have metrics that can show you their impact. They've been able to change that and really get um, mentorships going and uh, the Boys and Girls Club support of the youth so that we're actually seeing the teenagers get back in school and engage into society and grow into the leaders we need them to be. Because if you're, you're wondering like, okay, this is about investments, why am I talking about the Boys and Girls Clubs? In order to make really good investments work in Indian country, we need to have good leaders at the tribal level and these kids grow up to be those leaders and they have to be well-rounded, they have to be educated, they have to be well. And so what Carla works at every day is focusing on our kids and that is the most important job in my opinion and um, we're both mothers. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Carla and have her tell you a little bit about what's going on with our youth in Indian country um, and then we'll keep going up the age scale from there. Is this on? Since we're a youth development program, I, w I feel like I want to tell everybody in the room, can you come to the front of the room? I'm not going to make you move. <laughs> I notice everybody's in the back. But um, Willie Wani, many thanks, um, Valerie, for having me here today. I feel very honored and privileged to be here today and to bring the, our youth voice um, to the forefront. For me, there's such hope and opportunity for them and for you to be able to join us today and hear some of the story of how that we've been able to make a difference in the lives of our Native youth. Um, I'm very honored. I'm the Vice President of Native Services for Boys and Girls Club of America and I have the honor and privilege of working with an amazing team um, we call Native Services for Boys and Girls Club of America that provide technical assistance, direct support to all the tribes that we work with that have Boys and Girls Clubs on Native lands. Um, you did hear Valerie talk about what it looks like for Native youth, and I do have a hard time talking about that. Um, our youth are more at risk than any other youth in this nation. And the risk factors and those staggering statistics, um, I think that's what pushes our team to work hard every single day, and I really believe in people and purpose and passion, and that's what our team brings to Indian country. Just to give you a snapshot of our footprint, um, we have nearly 200 Boys and Girls Clubs on native lands um, in 28 states, um, representing 114 federally recognized tribes, as well as expanding into Alaska and Hawaii. 
And even under our care, we took in American Samoa because they need our support as well in culturally relevant services. Um, I don't know if Jackie, um, she's a colleague of mine in the audience, passed out. I have this impact report that um, Val was um, referencing about what we do for Native services. And I want to share with you that we actually have four different priority areas where our team focuses on these priorities that we believe are going to drive outcomes and build the capacity of every Boys and Girls Clubs on Native lands to effectively serve Native youth. And I'm going to start with one of our priorities, and it's um, program quality. And it's really making sure that the programs that we offer are going to drive outcomes. And on this impact report, you're going to see how we've taken some of the best Boys and Girls Club of America's programs and adapted them for Native youth, whether it's around STEM, digital literacy, nutrition education, or even resources around grief and loss. And you'll see a list of many programs that we adapted, even skills, masteries, and resistance training, knowing that there is um, a, a strong substance abuse issue um, on our native lands. And you'll see, I know Jackie's running to get those out really quick, but you'll see some of the impact measures. Um, when we look at native youth, and we know only 68% graduate from high school, 89, I believe, percent of our youth are saying they're getting A's and B's, and they're expected to graduate on time. That's huge. And knowing what Boys and Girls Clubs can do for our Native youth, I'm so proud to be part of this movement. Our second priority is really to strengthen organizations and building their capabilities to be here, not only for today, but many years to come. And so what our team does is we provide culturally relevant training, whether it's around you know, making sure that our CEOs of the clubs are learning about advanced philanthropy, whether it's learning how to strategic plan to have a long-term vision for their program. We also work directly with the um, direct frontline staff, we call our youth development professionals, making sure that they're equipped to really deliver effective programs that can drive those outcomes that you see on the sheet. Um, and our third priority is advocacy. And that's around really elevating the voice of our Native youth, but finding people that can advocate for the needs of Native youth. You heard from Valerie. She's one of our biggest champions in Indian country that truly cares about our people, our youth, and knowing that we're stewarding our youth to become future leaders, gainfully employed, productive in our communities, or to society. So um, our fourth strategy knowing the impact that we're making is really to grow our footprint. There's a need and there's such an opportunity. You heard from Valerie the number of federally recognized tribes that we have, and knowing how many that we're working with now, the opportunity to grow our footprint is huge. The opportunity is there, but the need is there as well. And I did have notes that I wanted to make sure I hit everything, but I just want to say that I'm very honored to be here to advocate for Native youth and the work that we do in our Boys and Girls Clubs, and I know that there's others that you're going to hear from and will get an opportunity to speak again, so um, I am going to pass this to Valerie. So um, I have just, over the years, been so impressed with the Boys and Girls Club. And one of the things that I think is so important is alongside all of their programming, they do have the cultural programs. And so at many of the conferences, it's the young boys and girls that are doing the drumming and the dancing and teaching us um, their customs and their traditions, which I think is, is awesome alongside all the other programs. So now we're going to move, um, as the, the youth get older, and look at... Um, university level education and you know Carla uh, listed some statistics that aren't pretty and they get even worse as we look at you know how many in Native Americans actually get into colleges and um, often they're the first ones in their family to get a college education um, and yet you know we have we have Harvard and Stanford and University of Pennsylvania and uh, you, we have a lot of um, good universities represented on this panel and yet we're kind of the exceptions to the rule. And so when we look at, at the, the pipeline of tribal leaders and, and, and making a true investment into Indian country, you know, we can't ignore 
the start of it all at the college level, which is really where I, in my opinion, where the investment discussion starts, where the entrepreneurial discussion starts. And so I'm really um, thrilled to have Jennifer on our panel today. Um, Jennifer is the current director of the Center for the Comparative Study of Race and Ethnicity at Stanford. And how I came to meet Jennifer is I'm a Stanford mom. Um, my oldest daughter graduated from Stanford in 2007. It changed her life. She's now one of the few native women in tech and she's taken two companies public and is currently head of marketing for a big tech company. And she, she credits Stanford for helping her get to her um, career goals. And then my youngest daughter is currently a student at Stanford. She, she'll graduate in 2020. She's on their beach volleyball team. So if you want to talk athletics and beach volleyball afterwards, please come up and see me because I will talk all day about that. Um, but when I met Jennifer, I basically said to her, you know, right now the problem I see with entrepreneurialism in Indian country is it's usually based on gaming or government programs, government handouts. And I want to see our native entrepreneurs learn how to create businesses that stand alone, like the rest of the world and the rest of the economy. And Stanford, I looked it up, Stanford has fostered more entrepreneurs and businesses than any other entity in the world. And Silicon Valley is known globally for that. And, and Stanford has a Latino entrepreneurial program, an African American entrepreneurial center. They have all kinds of wonderful entrepreneurial centers. And I was, I was thinking that I was just gonna get kind of a, a blank stare. And I said, why don't we have like a class focused on natives um, and entrepreneurial center for Native Americans? And Jennifer looked at me and said, okay, let's do it. <laughs> and so she is absolutely amazing. Um, her resume is really too long to give you the, the full um, resume as with everyone up here, but she's, she's currently a professor at Stanford. She's also the director, as I mentioned, for the Center for the Comparative Study of Race and Ethnicity. Um, she graduated with a BA from Vassar, and then her graduate work was at University of Pennsylvania. She's written two books uh, related to culture studies and African American studies, and she also taught at Duke University before coming to Stanford. Um, she's amazing, and she's very supportive of our efforts. And as I was telling her about all the things I thought we needed to do, she really held me um, to my comments and said, okay, you're teaching a class in the spring. So now I'm a professor or going to be <laughs> at Stanford because she's really supportive of our community. And I wanted her to talk today a little bit about how we see that supporting the future of investments into Indian country with starting with the entrepreneurial support that Stanford um, can give. Thank you so much, Val. Um, and I'm just really, truly honored to be on this dais with these amazing uh, colleagues, if I can even say that. Um, it's really very humbling. I also want to um, say that I'm here in part as the 1%. And what I mean by that is that there are over 2,000 faculty at Stanford, and I'm one of 22 of the 2,200 faculty who identify as a black woman. Now, we have even fewer Indian professors. But we are honored, as Val said, to have over 200 Native American students um, on Stanford's campus. And uh, the statistic you quoted about um, having those students go on to found many, many companies to have a real impact across the globe is impressive. And uh, they too are very diverse um, of those 200. I think we have over 80 of the 500 rec federally recognized tribes represented. I'll be talking about um, one of them at the end of my remarks. I just want to say that even though the number of Native American college students, particularly at predominantly white institutions like Stanford, um, is small, it is in many ways growing. And those students uh, require support. And I think that having an actual class, which will be the first, the one that um, Val's going to teach in the spring, uh, will be unique. Um, let me say a little bit more about this idea of connecting investors, students, and, and uh, helping to generate startups. At the Center uh, for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, we seek develop, to develop connections. And in her book, Social Startup Success, How the Best Nonprofits Launch, Scale Up, and Make a Difference, Kathleen Kelly Janis notes that one of the hardest aspects of approaching relationships with donors 
which uh, many young leaders don't have, is the unwritten set of rules of playing the game and the ways in which many more experienced organizational leaders, some of whom are actually on this panel, um, can help develop those connections to create leverage in the field. And I think that um, even though these students are in some ways already privileged, there still is a huge cultural gap on both sides from the investor's perspective and um, those of what the students need to learn to really make those. It's, it's not just putting people in the room. And this leads me to how we proceed in maybe teaching the class that um, BAL is going to do. So part of that involves something called community engaged learning. And this will pick up, um, and I feel like my presentation follows very much on Carla's, um, in the question of dealing with specifics around difference. So uh, it's not enough just to put people in the same room. We really believe for deep, engaged learning that we have to go to the res to see folks also in urban spaces, bring them to Stanford, that we have to take time to connect people. It's not an easy process. Um, and beyond linguistic and other kinds of things, we have to remember there's a culture of business um, and that some translating has to happen on all sides um, to bring people into the room and get and generate new kinds of startups and projects. So our hope for the class that will involve this community-engaged learning, and we've gotten some money from UPS, the, uh, a grant to help foster this, is that we would make those real connections and think too about the ethics of bringing people into the same room. Um, so that in order to do deep learning, it involves not just theory or reading books, but also truly meeting people where they are and making them uh, understand one another on a more level playing field. And I think that Stanford is a perfect place, ironically, right, where we have the funds to be able to make those connections. And we have students who've already proven themselves in that way. I'll say the other thing that's really gonna be very exciting about this class, which I think is one of the first in the nation, um, uh, as in the United States, not the many nations uh, within, but is that we offer quarter, we are the home of Native American studies at Stanford and have been since 1996. And we teach classes in education, linguistics, feminist, gender, and sexuality studies, technology, and law. But because we only have a graduate school of business, undergraduates at Stanford don't even get to take classes um, that focus on entrepreneurship or business. Those are very rare. So this is going to be unique in terms of the B school, in terms of Native American studies. And while it's geared towards Native students, it's really open to everyone. And I want to make a plea here for uh, the value of investing across difference and in uh, Indian country as the panel is, is titled because we can't think that it's only just um, helping our own in a narrative way. I mean, that's part of, again, the ethic of comparative studies in race and ethnicity. And I'm just gonna, um, oh, I'm sorry, I haven't been using this, uh, close with uh, two examples um, of Native American entrepreneurship the first actually comes from the 19th century. Um, believe it or not, in the same era as Leland Stanford was becoming uh, a major uh, capitalist in the United States, there was uh, a woman named Edmodia Lewis, who was Ojibwe and Haitian. And she became the first sculptor in the United States to uh, make a living being a sculptor. She had to go to Rome, Italy, in order to do that. Um, but she did make a living, although she wasn't able to have a factory or kind of a workshop like many other sculptors in the era um, because she couldn't afford it. And I keep thinking about Edmonia Lewis, even though she, quote unquote, was a success when she wasn't meant to survive, um, nevertheless could have, had she had the proper investment, most of her writings uh, have to do with people not paying her for the work she did, or that she had to carve things herself because she couldn't afford to pay others. You know, that that's an example then of someone, even though who, you know, there are businesses in Indian country, they're not scaled to the level that they could be if they had proper angel investors and investment. The second comes from a recent graduate last year, Matthew Yellowtail, who's from the Crow Nation in Montana, uh, won the university prize. He wrote a wonderful uh, screenplay, which we hope Netflix will pick up. Um, and it was inspired by a digital storytelling class he had from the Generations Project. And um, he was 
really hoping to kind of portray his family um, in this hometown of Wyola, Montana. And in it, he includes a fictionalized version of his sister who also has a small business selling accessories. Again, a wonderful investment opportunity. Um, so past and present, um, there are wonderful examples of uh, excellent work. I'm giving you two from the cultural realm, but I would say, and you'll hear this from some of my colleagues on the panel, you know, we need investment in every way. So gas stations, uh, infrastructure, healthcare, um, all kinds of things. But, uh, you know, here are two examples, I think, of uh, culture work that would have benefited from, and I hope in maybe Matt's case, will benefit from uh, future investment. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, you know, I uh, recently did, uh, I'm also a filmmaker, I recently made a film on Wilma Mankiller, who was the first female elected principal chief of the Cherokee Nation and one of our greatest leaders of all time. And she believed that you had to lead with education um, or your nation would not survive. And so I just really appreciate all of the work that both uh, Jennifer and Carla are doing with our youth. Now we're going to move um, a little more into the investment side, uh, actual investment side, even though our kids are our investments. And um, Heather Thompson has given me a tough job here because she's an overachiever and I, I cannot possibly properly introduce her. Um, so I'm going to only do a short piece <laughs> because you're going you're gonna to love learning from her. I learn from her every time I talk to her. So um, Heather is nationally recognized as a Native American lawyer and leader in Indian country. She's an economic development expert. She's an enrolled member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Nation. She is with the Indian law practice at Greenberg and is it Tarag? Tarag. And a principal now with Native American capital. She's a specialist on tribal opportunity zones, which is very interesting and very new. It's called the Tribal Opportunity Zone Venture Group and Seven Generations Indoor Native Indoor Farm. So she's also doing indoor farming on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Um, she's an author of the well-read uh, piece, The Competitive Advantages of Doing Business with Native American Tribal Governments. Her resume is two more pages, which I cannot read, but the point being she, she went to Harvard Law and she is one of our most accomplished Indian lawyers and Indian women, and I couldn't be more delighted to have her here with us today. You're gonna to learn so much from Heather. Come on up. Does anybody in the room wanna make money? Okay, that's what I'm here to talk about. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces. How many of you already work in Indian country in some capacity? Okay, how many of you are on the investor side? Okay, not as much, but that's what we're going to talk about. So Teresa and I are going to really talk about the investor side and sort of demystifying this process and how do you make money in Indian country. And, and as Val said, I, it always drives me crazy. We have um, so much investment in emerging markets and third world countries, and we seem to think that, you know, that that is completely achievable in reducing that risk, but somehow Indian country is just a completely um, foreign entity and overwhelms us every time we, we ha start to have that conversation. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk through some of that. So hopefully we can demystify it. We can talk about some of the resources that are available and we're gonna talk to you about how to make some money. So um, while doing well as well. I have clients that are paying 20 to 24% for their debt right now, which is insane. Absolutely insane in this country. But capital is so hard to access. In fairness, those are higher risk industries with the tribes. Um, but it is so hard to access capital. And as Valerie said, she's done it for so many years and she finally just can't do it anymore because it's exhausting. It is absolutely exhausting because you're having the same conversation over and over again. It's not that scary. It's not that scary, I promise, right? So that is what I do at Greenberg Traug is I help demystify that risk. We help do the political analysis. We help do the legal analysis. We help put together creative collateral because as Val said, the collateral is a little difficult with the land ownership issues. But there are ways to make these deals happen. There's a way to protect yourself from sovereign immunity. We do this all day, every day, and people are successful and they make money. So please don't be so overwhelmed by this. There's an entire, there's a thousand Native American attorneys now that know this space, that have done these deals through gaming, that now can re replicate them in this field, in this space. 
Um, so my first thing is why invest in Indian country? There's money to be made. I mean, the philanthropic side is super important, but in the long run, we have to be able to sustain ourselves. We cannot sustain our language programs, our cultural programs, our youth programs, if we are not making our own money and if we don't have that economy. So we need you to have faith in us and help us make money, real money, long term. So that's number one, why invest in Indian country? Two, every investment is an impact investment. And what do I mean by that? Tribal nations have no tax revenue to run their governments. I'm gonna say that one more time. Tribal nations have no tax revenue to run their governments. So they have all the same obligations as the state of California, the county, the city. They've gotta have schools and roads and tax collection. And they have no tax base. If they have land, that land is largely in trust with the federal government and it's non-taxable. There's no income tax, arguably. And the, state, and the sales tax is a constant litigation battle with the state. So effectively, you can either get grants and run your government on grants, or you can depend on the federal government for a handout, neither of which sounds like a very good long-term strategy for running your government. So what do you do? You participate in the private marketplace, which is hard enough. I mean, can you imagine running the state of California by running a hotel and a grocery store and a gas station, but that is exactly what tribal nations have to do. So if I hear one more comment about casinos, I'm gonna scream and rip my hair out. But that is participation in the private marketplace. You have to go out and own a grocery store, own a casino, own whatever it takes to give you a margin significant enough to pay for those schools, those cultural centers, those language preservation programs. And so while the Boys and Girls Club is about as sexy as, a, as in a thing you can invest in, so please go that direction. But while those programs are absolutely necessary, we need a freaking gas station to pay for them long term because your five bucks is gonna run out from the philanthropy side eventually. And so people don't think of these investments as being that exciting, but you have to help these tribes build that private economy and have these long term investments and things that are gonna be able to sustain themselves as governments and as people. So what we do is in the back, the paper that uh, Valerie referenced, so on the back table actually is this very short paper called The Competitive Advantages of Doing Business with Native American Tribes and Tribal Corporations. So it's not the easiest thing, but it can be the best thing, right? Because you're doing business with a tribal nation, largely. And guess who doesn't pay federal taxes? So if you structure this correctly, the portion of the business that's owned by the tribal nation doesn't pay any federal income taxes and can refeed into that business. So you're gonna be making more money long term. That's just one example. There's also a series of tax incentives that the federal government has put in place for taxable investors to try and attract that capital because it is so difficult to get the capital in. Um, the most recent one, of course, is the Opportunity Zones. Have you guys like talked about this ad nauseum, I think, right, at SOCAP um, thus far? So you know the basics of the, of the Opportunity Zones. But I'm here to tell you that 20 to 30% of those Opportunity Zones are in Indian country. They're on Indian reservations. And as Val said, you know, usually I'm on the, the legal side and I'm structuring these deals. But at my large law firm, what I'm seeing at Greenberg Triarg is these giant funds coming in, setting up investment parameters of 50 to $100 million that is going solely into real estate and is not going, in my opinion, to the purpose of this statute. And getting to these um, smaller businesses, these grassroots projects. Um, so what I'm hoping that you guys here at SOCAP can help push people's limits on what they're thinking about in utilizing those opportunity zones. Because yes, in Indian country, we do have some of those larger infrastructure projects, but really, the majority of our projects are two to five million dollars. They're an absolute sweet spot for some of these family offices, for some of these foundations. You have to be a little bit braver than the average investor. You have to be a little bit more creative than the average investor. And 
trust us that it's not so scary and we can help reduce your risk and in increase your profit. So if there's one thing that, I, uh, there, we have this other hand out in the back. So like I said, I don't normally get in on this side of it, but I was watching all this money. My friend just walked in that we've been talking about these opportunity zones, but I'm watching all of this money leak out the door at Greenberg Traug to these large funds and none of it being targeted towards Indian country. So on Tuesday, my, my friends and I that are in the finance world, we just started our own company in order to make those matchmaking between the investors and the opportunity zones in Indian country to make sure at least some of that is being diverted to these Indian country opportunity zones. And uh, most of these are gonna be some in your smaller range, like I said, that I think are really good matches for a lot of the investors in SOCAP. So Valerie wanted me to give you some examples of projects, and I think Teresa's gonna go into some specific examples of where she's been as an investor. Um, as I said, the tribes have to make money where they make money. So anything you can think of that you're interested in investing in, you can partner with a tribe and they will probably also be interested. And you can structure it so that you can take best advantage of their tax incentives for investing with them and their non-taxable status. Um, we've got everything from one to two million dollars to, I think my favorite project of the week is um, we have a tribal owned corporation who has a trillion plus dollar project which is a substitute it's an indigenous design substitute to the border wall it's a green design that takes the place of it and is an alternative to the panama canal so that we don't get choked out of trade by china on the panama canal and i said you know what that is just crazy enough to work um, and everybody they've showed it to thus far has been really well received so that just shows you the creativity when you put indigenous minds together. Um, renewable energy. Rosebud Indian Reservation um, on the, in South Dakota. They are trying to build a totally self-sustained uh, community. I know Nick was building one on Pine Ridge as well. They all have microgrid components to them um, to, ke to keep that self-sustainability. We also have a client of seven tribes, seven Sioux Lakota tribes in North and South Dakota that have come together to build a utility scale wind project, about $15 million for the first tranche that they're trying to raise. Uh, grassroots projects, ones that are a really good, nice cultural match. People get excited about these, they're great projects. Um, native indoor farms. We have a huge movement in Indian country for sustainable local agriculture, right? Self-sufficiency. When the United States was not winning the military war, they destroyed our food economy. They destroyed the buffalo. They distributed food and made our peoples dependent upon the federal government for survival. So there's a giant cultural movement already going for food sustainability. The problem is it's largely grant-based at this moment, right? And so how do we create that so it's sustainable? So Native Indoor Farms is all about leapfrogging the problem of not owning our own land. That's another conversation, but the best, most arable lands on our reservations were given to non-Native farmers. So let's just skip that. Let's create our own indoor farms. What's the tipping point? What do we have to grow from a microgreens or pharmaceutical greens standpoint? Ship that out, make money on that, make enough profit to pay back our investor and keep a certain percentage for a local grow for our local fruits and vegetables, maybe 10, 20%. So that's working on that right now, and that's intended to be scalable for each of these reservations. Find that, that, that magic point, and then eventually, when your investors are paid off, shift that uh, ratio so that you have a larger local self-sustaining grow of, of healthy foods. Um, another one, which is a really nice cultural match, um, I'm from the Cheyenne River Sioux, we're Lakota, we have a very strong warrior culture um, and so we have a local grassroots company who is creating a for-profit fire jumping uh, a wildland fire company. And the goal of that one is to make enough money when you're going out that it can help subsidize the local structural fire department because we don't have local fire departments because we have no tax base. So they go out, make money fighting fires here in California, make enough profit to pay their own folks, pay back the loan, and then subsidize their local um, structure fire um, and then I've got another tribe that's cr uh, so that one's about two to three million sorry I'm leaving off that the indoor farm is about three to six each farm three to six million each farm 
Um, the Native Fire Jumper Company, they're looking for about two to three million. Um, the next one is a tribally owned bison herd. You've got a lot of tribes that are trying to work on prairie preservation to raise their buffalo in a traditional manner and not no feedlots, you know, all grass fed. All Ted Turners are feedlotted, sorry, just so you guys know. Um, so this is more expensive buffalo, but it's better for the environment. Um, so they're looking to expand a 10 to $20 million profitable project. We have a significantly more demand for buffalo than can be met. There's anybody who's interested in investing in buffalo ranches, uh, buffalo much better for the environment in general than cattle. We have uh, a demand that significantly outstrips the current supply of buffalo in the United States that are able to meet that. Um, and then if you're just looking more for a good profit margin um, investments, um, the three companies that, the three industries that are in most demand in these large rural areas, the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation is the size of Connecticut. Um, my reservation is about the size of Connecticut. They're extremely rural. They're never going to make a dime on gaming. You know, you've got to use what you've got. So one, a lot of people are going towards e-commerce. So if you're interested in e-commerce and locating them in low tax um, areas, any e-commerce idea you got, you've got a partner in Indian country that's interested in that, number one. Um, two, the less sexy investments, but they have higher rates of return in these very rural areas because this is what people buy. There's not that many different industries that people are going to spend their money on. One, gas stations. The number one thing, gas stations and sea stores, these are very remote areas got to have a gas station to get around where you're going. They have good returns. Um, I don't know a single tribe that doesn't need a good gas station. Um, and these are all, you know, two, three million dollar range. Um, fast food, not the sexiest thing, um, but uh, not the healthiest thing, but in great demand. Obviously open to healthier options. Subway's really growing on a lot of reservations. Um, but some sort of healthy fast food chain desperately needed almost no food options in most of these rural reservation areas. And then third, farm supply stores. Um, a lot of tribes are looking to own farm supply stores and uh, in-house that. Everybody is driving off reservation, sometimes two, three hours away in order to obtain, these are good businesses with good profit margins to get so, sort of basic farm supplies. And those are all sort of under, uh, depending upon obviously the size, two to five million um, investments. So those are, those are not only concrete examples, those are like actual clients that I work with that called me yesterday when they said Heather had an opportunity zone company that I have the contact information for. I mean, these are real, these are real investments, these are real people, these are real projects, and they are really doable. So if I can leave you with that, this is completely achievable and good investment. Thank you. I told you she was amazing. Um, one thing I would add to what Heather said, so one of the most difficult deals I ever um, did as an investment banker in Indian country was financing a local Denny's on the Navajo reservation. And I got sort of the same reaction she's talking about. I couldn't find an investor. It was like, that is so unexciting. Um, but I finally, it took me two years. I finally got the money and that Denny's owner is the largest employer now in that county. So he's bringing economic development, it was needed, and now he's also mentoring other businesses as kind of an elder in the tribe. So sometimes we have to get past the fact that, okay, Denny's is not necessarily sexy or healthy. I don't think it's unhealthy, but, but you know, what Heather's trying to point out, what I'm trying to point out, I think we're all saying is, everything is impactful on an Indian reservation, and sometimes just the jobs alone make a difference. So I don't know how many people at Denny's can possibly employ, but he's the largest employer in that county. So anyhow, thank you for that insight, Heather. And now we're going to round it out with uh, Teresa Dunbar, who is the Impact Investment Analyst at Manchester Capital Management, where she works closely with the Swift Foundation, implementing their 100% impact portfolio. And she also has a resume that's too long for me to list everything. These women are just so amazing. She got her MBA uh, from UC Davis. Um, and what I want to say about Teresa, though, I asked her to be on this panel because as Heather and I can attest to it, so often 
we meet investors that just don't want to deal with everything we've talked about in Indian country, but Teresa does. She rolls up her sleeves and, and just dives right in. She's made investments, or what her, her foundation or the, her clients have made investments. She's recommended investments. I met her with a group of potential investment um, funds and foundations, and it was so funny because when I talked about the Denny's and the gas station, the reaction from the others uh, was what we would expect. Oh no, we wanna do cultural programs. We just wanna do indigenous language programs. Teresa got it. She was like, no, I understand. You have, to, you have to invest in infrastructure and you have to think about those things. So I invited her to be on the panel because she's someone that actually puts her money where her mouth is and she's um, just a great, uh, she's, she's in the social impact space. Most the other, the three of, or four of us are, are really coming from the outside. And she, so she's a real champion of Indian deals. So welcome, Teresa Dunbar. Thank you. Can this on? Thank you, Val. And I'm, again, I'm also very honored to be on this panel with everybody and, um, and this amazing team of women. And actually, I don't actually need to speak after Heather because she gave out all the information. <laughs> but uh, but um, in general, actually, before I start, I just want to give a shout out to Edgar Villanueva. I don't think he's actually in the room, but his book, Decolonizing Wealth, um, I haven't read it yet, but I'm so excited to start reading it as soon as, as, soon as I get over the hangover that is so cap. So um, as Val mentioned, I work at Manchester Capital Management. I'm the impact investment analyst there. We manage wealth for about 50 families. I work with a subset of them that are interested in aligning their values um, and their investments. Within that subset, I work in particular with the SWIFT Foundation, and what they do is they, su they support projects for sustainable agriculture, biological cultural diversity, um, uh, building resilient local economies, and also investing um, in innovations in finance that are not extractive. Uh, they do this by partnering with indigenous groups, um, Native American communities, and local allies. The, um, they work in the Canadian Pacific Northwest, the United States, predominantly in the Southwest and the Great Plains, and then also in the Andes and Amazon regions. And as Val mentioned, they have a 100% impact investment portfolio, which means I get to work with them across all asset classes. And so within the space of trying to figure out how to do and how to get money into Indian country. It's really a small portion of what I do, so I do not claim to be an expert in any way. I'm just here to help people and able to get these investments into great places and things that need to be invested in. Um, so from my perspective, I'm coming from, I sit behind a desk most of the time and I help people with money, get money into places they wanna get money into. And, um, but also just to give you a roundabout, I'm, the investments that I'm talking about are on the smaller side, so maybe about $200,000, $500,000 deals. And when I think about, um, Val asked me to talk about like challenges and, and what I've seen, and what I really think about is actually the, the journey and the opportunity that I've had um, for learning um, with the SWIFT Foundation and doing this for the past eight to 10 years. And really, when I think about it, one of the main things that I think a lot of philanthropic bodies deal with is how to, how to balance respect for self-determination and being responsive to community-led and informed projects while finding investments that fit within their mission statements. Um, often those are at heads with one another. And so one of the examples that I really wanted to talk about was an investment that we made um, into Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation who um, happened to be led by Nick Tilson at the time. Now he runs NDN, um, and uh, he's amazing, if you haven't talked to him. Um, but, um, but what was interesting is that that investment in particular was for affordable housing. And when I talk about the SWIFT Foundation, I mentioned earlier, they're really interested in more sustainable agriculture um, and building resilient economies. And so when, I, when we were talking about the investment with the board, there, one of them brought up, say, hey, why are we looking at an affordable housing project? You know, um, Why are we looking at... at, at at giving loans for this, and and what what ensued was an amazing conversation about about really looking at not the what of an investment, but the how of an investment. Which means it's not just when you're looking at it, it's not just an affordable housing project, it's not just green agriculture, it's not just whatever it is that people feel like investing in, but it's the how that this investment came to be, which is 
how, who's at the table that are making the decisions that this is an important thing that needs to happen in the community? Who are who are the voices that are being heard? Who are the who are the decision makers? Who is going to benefit um, from these projects? And and how will the how will the how will the money continue to circulate within the communities? And so, with that kind of conversation, we're just like, hell yeah, we're going to do this because we know the work that Nick, that Nick and his and his team really put into to figuring out what the community needed. And it's not just affordable housing. Check out their website. It's a bunch of other stuff that they're the amazing stuff that they're doing. So. Um, that's one thing that I think is really needed in the philanthropic sector is really trying to, hey, let's get over ourselves and our mission statements and really listen to what the communities are talking about and the informedness that they already bring um, to the process. Uh, the second one is a very, when I think of, of the journey and I think of things that I've learned along the way, it's really, um, this is a very practical, this is a very practical side of it. As, a, as someone, I'm an analyst. I look at spreadsheets all day. I sit behind a computer. It's really boring compared to what all these ladies are doing, and um, and I'm looking like it's. Thanks. But I look at like I look at pitch decks and stuff like that. And so, as an investor that sits in Santa Barbara, California, um, and not within communities, and it's intimidating for 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 a lot of people to figure out how to do investments in Indian country. You have you have a lot of things that I especially like I don't know about. You know that some of the stuff that's already been talked about. Um, land trust laws. You have um, layers of tribal governments. You have Bureau of Indian Affairs. You have community mores and protocols that I just don't understand. Um, that I would love to, but I just I'm not there. And and then you have funding streams that that are also in the region that work together. You have HUD. You have new t new market tax credits. You have now you have opportunity zones and you don't know how that's going to be coming into play. So what I basically was able to do is like I, I just came to grips that I couldn't know everything and what we ended up doing is finding amazing partners who are out there who already know how to do this stuff, who know how to do it well and who know the nuances of, of it. And, and I think of the, some of the people that we've already worked with and some of you have already heard from them and in particular is um, Crystal Cornelius of OISTA, um, Dave Castillo from Native Capital Access. Um, Nick Tilson, I'm going to call you out whenever I can. <laughs> but um, and these are just some examples of 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 some of the people we have investments with. Um, we've also supported um, Native American Natural Foods, also known as Tonka Bar, and those, that was a direct um, uh, equity and loan investment. So, and also, I mean, in general, an easy way to just to get involved is support your your local tribal banks and also Native CDFIs. So, um, anyway, okay, I think I'm over time. No, you're Oh, no, but I think I'm over time anyway. So, okay, okay. Um, basically ask me if you have any questions. <laughs> is this on? Yes, it is. Okay, so we are almost at the end, but we definitely wanted to leave room for questions. Um, we hope you may have some because we've given you an awful lot of information. I, we've got one right there. Speak loudly. What's your name and where are you from first? Hi, I'm Jill Lipsky Kane, and I'm a, an evaluator, and I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you can't tell from my accent, I'm, yeah. Uh, so I um, am really interested in uh, not only impact uh, measurement, um, that uh, measurement and evaluation is really my bread and butter, and um, me and a few other colleagues at our consulting firm are really interested in impact um, investment measurement. Um, but I am also interested in investing. And um, there was a, a mention of um, small investment packages, but we're, you set it to like 200K, and I'm like, wow. Um, so what are investment opportunities uh, for those who want to start getting investing to build wealth but don't have a whole lot to start with. Um, great and great I, question. I, and, I, and avoiding like just like donating online and, and but actually wanting to turn around on profit and um, addressing these significant um, inequities in our country. That, that is a great question and I'm going to take it because I actually haven't talked too much about what I really do now for my day job. Um, I left Indian country because I wanted to make a bigger difference, a bigger impact. I was frustrated. 
and I am now the executive director of Investor Circle and Social Venture Network, and we are uh, one of the oldest nonprofits in the social impact space. And what we do is we support early stage um, angel investors who really need to learn about investing, and we match them with entrepreneurs and social impact companies. And because just by chance, because I'm Native American, I'm now bringing more Native projects. So some of the projects she's mentioned are now on our platform, in our pitch sessions. Um, you can see them on our guest. And then we have so many investors like yourself who maybe they want to start with 10,000, 20,000, but we pool the capital and we do it all as a nonprofit. So we're not a fund, we're not charging fees, we're doing it as, from an educational standpoint. And that's across all sectors. But it's exciting because I am able to now start putting more native projects into that. I think Crystal, C, um, her CDFI, OISTA, um, is going to be a part of our entrepreneurial services. And so it's, it's just really an exciting time. And I would suggest that you talk to me afterwards. I don't want to take up too much time here. But there really is no amount that's too small to get started in impact investing. And the one thing that we're focused on at ICSVN is we don't believe you have to give up profit for purpose. And we try to support that. And we have fostered companies like Ben and & Jerry's and Eileen Fisher that are now really big publicly traded companies, but they started small with small investments. And so um, just talk to me afterwards, but that it's absolutely possible and doable. Any other questions? Well then, as we wrap it up, I wanna um, leave you, I'm gonna ask each panelist to um, say one last thing. And the question I wanted to throw at them is if they had to ask for all of you sitting here, if they had a request for the room, what would that be? Um, and I'm going to start with Carla. This time, I'm going to make sure my ask is correct. So <laughs> um, going back to what I spoke to early, my ask would be, in efforts to steward our Native youth to become future leaders, gainfully employed, and thriving community members, my ask is to support our growth strategy as the need is great while supporting long-term sustainability. Our success will be predicated on continued focus on partnering with new and current champions of Indian country all across the nation. Our Native youth deserve nothing less. So there's my ask. <laughs> um, I guess I would echo uh, some of my colleagues here on the panel and say that learning how is not a something that shouldn't be daunting um, and invest in education, but also, um, you know, move beyond one's comfort zone. And root for Stanford. <laughs> um, my ask is that you would introduce yourself to um, our entity. It's ic-svn.org, um, because we, again, are a nonprofit, and we would love to match um, interest with ask in terms of investors and companies needing money. Uh, we're known as sort of the oldest matchmaker in the space, so we'd love to learn about uh, either side of the equation. My ask is that if you're on the investor side, that within the next two years you make an investment of some sort in Indian country. And if you're not on the investor side, that you convince somebody on the investor side within the next two years to make an investment in an Indian country project. That's a good one. <laughs> um, I would say sometimes what I hear out there is that there's not, there, I, they don't, people don't know of any investable opportunities in Indian country. And I want you to all remember that that's a bunch of crap. And so, um, um, yeah, it's a financial term. Um, and I, and what I would like to say is in general, just as an example, I was on the Navajo and Hopi reservation just a couple months ago. And I was only there for three days. And within that span, there are so many investable avenues for people to get involved in. I met three small business owners actively fundraising for capital. O OXDX, Spirit Mountain Roasting, Dine Jewelry. I met two Native American business incubators. Two, uh, three of the women are here right now. Tuba City Project and the New Mexico Community College Native, Native Entrepreneurs and Residence Program. I met one housing and business space development project, Terraform Development. I met one large multinational, sorry, multi-million dollar renewable energy project, Navajo Power. I mean, the list goes on. And this is just three days. I mean, seriously, I met a, a small scale panel project. 
um, called Native Renewables that's trying to get electricity to the last remaining 1,500 families on Navajo Reservation that still don't have electricity. Um, two regional Native CDFIs and one young, amazing Ameri Native American farmer who's reintroducing organic, Native, and traditional, traditional seeds and crops while mentoring at-risk youth. So, again, that was three days, and that was only three of the 753 federally and state-recognized nations, so get out there. So I just um, want to say that in the Cherokee language, we use the word gadugi, which means working for the good of one another in community. And so I would um, wish you gadugi as you continue with your SOCAP journey. Uh, but please do come up and uh, say hello to us. We just thank you for your time today. God bless you. <laughs>